the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. This is Reveal. I'm Al Ledson. This hour, we're looking at domestic terrorism with the nonprofit newsroom, The Investigative Fund. They found the federal government is focusing almost all of its resources on terrorists who claim they're fighting in the name of Islam. Now, most of those plots have been foiled. But when it comes to right-wing terrorists, authorities haven't been as successful. Most of those plots have been carried out. The suspects are on foot. It's a white male, uh, and about 25 to 30, a white female that's about the same age. They're in Sakin, and they're heavily armed. The suspects are a married couple. The husband had a habit of proclaiming his views any chance he got online or even on TV. Reveals Catherine Miskowski joins me now. Hi, Al. Hey, Catherine. Okay, so who are we dealing with here? Start with the husband. His name's Jared Miller, and he spent a lot of time recording himself. Thanks for watching my video. That's how we're going to get to know him. Hey, Manning just threw his second interception in the first half of the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Oh, I'm just going to do it. Anyway. Sounds like Jared was just the kind of guy who liked to chill out, get high, and talk smack about football. Yeah, but in a lot of these online videos, he's mouthing off about guns, drug laws, the police state. See, Jared was this 30-something high school dropout, and he dealt pot. And in the summer of 2013, he was living with his wife, Amanda, in Lafayette, Indiana. By then, he had a pretty long rap sheet. People are getting arrested every stinking day for marijuana. And for pills and other kinds of drugs, just because they're self-medicating themselves. He shot this in his low-rent apartment under the spinning ceiling fan. He was on house arrest. And then they give you one of these fashionable little ankle bracelets. Pretty uncomfortable thing right here. You can see it's made an indent on my foot. Jared saw himself as the victim of an illegitimate system. Here's what he saw when he looked outside. Here's my front window here. That is the courthouse. So you have to go down to that big monument to tyranny and submit crawling and groveling on your hands and knees. Oh, give me permission to do this. Give me permission to do that. I don't know. Sounds a little like Nazi Germany to me or maybe communist Russia. Eventually, Jared failed at house arrest. The landlord evicted him and Amanda for not paying their rent so he had to serve out the rest of his term in jail. He told his wife how he felt about that in another video. Hey babe, it's your husband. Jared's felony convictions made it hard for him to find a job and illegal for him to own a firearm. He didn't believe in these laws. Online, he found kindred spirits in something called the Sovereign Citizen Movement. Our partners at the nonprofit newsroom, The Investigative Fund, have reported on its followers. Here's journalist David Nywert. People who declare themselves sovereign citizens don't belong to an organization. They belong to a belief system. David says they tend to see the police this way. As an oppressive force of the conspiratorial new world order, which is trying to enslave all of mankind. And they are very revolutionary in their outlook. David found that sovereign citizens pose a big threat to law enforcement. In the last nine years, they've killed nine police officers and injured another 12. That movement appealed to the Millers back in Indiana, where things weren't going very well. After house arrest, the eviction, and Jared's stint in jail... They were looking for where to go, and here was this guy out in Nevada who was running for governor, touting the same ideology that they were... His name was David Lori Vanderbeek. A lot of people are going into law enforcement as they did in Nazi Germany because it validates their worst traits as uh, sadists. I'm ready right now to fight to the death for your freedom. I'm ready right now to go to jail for the rest of my life for your freedom. What are you willing to do for your own freedom, Americans? The title of this video is If Obama Sends Police to Take Your Guns, Execute Them. And it was, in fact, that video that inspired Jared and they shortly after that moved out to Nevada to begin working on his campaign. Here's Jared and Amanda hightailing it out of Indiana. Well, it's great, it's Goodbye, Indiana. Hello, Kentucky. Woohoo! That's one of the few recordings we have with Amanda's voice in it, too. But her social media suggests that she was on board with Jared's views. 
The Millers had barely made it into Nevada when Jared got in trouble again. I'm looking at a $525 ticket for driving on a suspended license. In this phone call, he complained to the Indiana Bureau of Motor Vehicles. You know, that's a whole month of rent. I can't get a job. As, as, as a person of the DMV, can you tell me how many laws are on the books concerning drivers? Well, I mean, unfortunately, no, I can't tell you like an exact number. Right here is where Jared goes from cranky citizen hassling a government employee to something else. All right, well, I'm going to go to court down here in Nevada to contest this uh, ticket. And if they come to arrest me for non-compliance or whatever, I'm just going to start shooting people. Word of that call reached the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Detectives paid the Millers a visit and concluded the couple didn't pose a threat. David says it's not uncommon for police to react this way. Because they seem like sort of hopeless losers, uh, they sort of minimize the threat that they pose. Sometimes the Millers posed in costumes along the strip for tips. Amanda worked at Hobby Lobby like she had back home in Indiana. And the candidate who drew them to Vegas, David Vanderbeek, he introduced them to another politician. They crashed my campaign luncheon. That's Gordon Martinez. He was campaigning for sheriff on the idea that the Vegas Police Department was corrupt. He'd been a detective in that department. It didn't take him long to feel nervous about the Millers. Jared started out by saying, geez, I want to help. I want to be part of your campaign for sheriff. And then he began explaining his criminal record. Uh, in his opinion, uh, really didn't amount to a whole lot. He declined Jared's offer of help. He just wasn't getting it. And I finally just had to say, uh, uh, you can't be anywhere near me, and I can't be anywhere near you. But the Millers didn't fade quietly away. Gordon kept spotting them at political events around town. There they are, there they are. And, and I, was, I was always kind of expecting some type of acting out. Um, there's just a little voice in the back of my mind that said, keep your eye on this guy because he's a, he's a weirdo. Another place Jared and Amanda turned up, the Bundy Ranch, where they would find an even bigger stage for their radical views. Now to a tense standoff between a Nevada rancher and armed supporters on one side and the federal government on the other. This was in April of 2014 when rancher Clyde and Bundy escalated a decades-long dispute with the federal government over his refusal to pay fees for grazing his cattle on public lands. His armed supporters gathered at the ranch outside Las Vegas. On social media, they've called it a range war. With each passing day, more and more protesters arrive to support the Bundys, one of them carrying an AK-47. The Millers were among them. Jared gave interviews to news crews. For this one with Al Jazeera America, Jared's tricked out for armed resistance against the New World Order. Full camouflage and a black tactical vest, packing a rifle and a handgun. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of being a slave. I'm afraid of living under tyranny. Jared said to a TV news crew while heavily armed that he was willing to die for his beliefs. The Millers believed that they were oppressed by a tyrannical police state, but the law still wasn't watching them. After he threatened violence in a phone call, detectives gave them a pass, and his sovereign citizen beliefs didn't raise eyebrows at the Bundy Ranch. Remember, it was illegal for him, a former felon, to even possess a weapon. That would have been reason enough to arrest him. In another interview at the ranch with NBC affiliate KRNV, Jared said, I feel sorry for any federal agents that want to come in here and try to push us around or anything like that. I, I really don't want violence toward them, but if they're going to come bring violence to us, well, if that's the language they want to speak, we'll learn it. Well, that sounds kind of like a menacing statement, I have to tell you. But it wasn't violence that ended their stay at the Bundy Ranch. David Nywert says it was the Bundys. They realized that he was just trouble and they asked him to leave. While the couple was at the ranch, Amanda lost her job at Hobby Lobby. The Millers were broke and couldn't pay their rent. A neighbor they befriended took them in. Until... Sunday, June 8, 2014. That's the day Las Vegas emergency dispatchers field a blizzard of phone calls. 11, 22, and 14 seconds. Hello, do you have a police? 
converge on the pizza place. Inside, there's a horrific scene. We need medical inside feces now! Medical inside feces now! Here's what happened. Officers Alan Beck and Igor Soldo were eating lunch at CeCe's Pizza. Amanda and Jared shot them point blank. The ambush lasted less than a minute. Jared and Amanda make off with the officers' weapons and ammunition. They leave a don't tread on me flag with a rattlesnake on it, along with a swastika pin and a note. They aren't done yet. He's still going, he's heading southbound on Ellis, uh, heading towards Walmart. Jared walks into a nearby Walmart with Amanda following him. Shots fired inside Walmart. Shots fired inside Walmart. And this guy came in yelling that there's a revolution coming to get out of Walmart, that the police are coming. And, and that they will shoot us, and he started shooting in the Walmart, and we ran out the back door. On one call, a guy who fled Walmart says another man with a handgun is still inside, trying to stop the shooters. He was doing nothing with a gun. Okay. That man, Joseph Wilcox, is following Jared and aims at him. Amanda's nearby. She fires her gun and kills Joseph with one shot. Inside the store, some customers take cover with employees. Amanda and Jared exchange gunfire with officers. We have two down in the corner. They're both armed, look like they've been shot. They're covering both directions. In the end, Amanda takes her own life. A police officer's bullet kills Jared. David Nywert says Jared and Amanda died trying to kill more police officers. They came to believe that the only proper response to police oppression was gunfire, and they acted on it. Following the beliefs of the sovereign citizen movement, the Millers headed to the shopping center that day, hell-bent on resistance. They left the apartment they were living at earlier that morning, having told their roommate that they were leaving that day with the express purpose of murdering police officers. That's research analyst Zoe Thorkelson. The roommate didn't tell anyone, by the way, because she didn't think they were serious. Zoe studied the attack for a report that the Justice Department commissioned, focusing on the police's tactical response. Security camera footage shows the Millers loitering near the site of their attack for almost two and a half hours before they fired the first shot. So there's evidence that the Millers were essentially waving around that area for the opportunity to strike out against police. There isn't any evidence that the Millers specifically targeted officers back in Soldo in this incident. The officers died simply because they were in uniform. But what we found was that the two officers that were ambushed, there's nothing in the decisions that they made that could have been changed to prevent this incident. I must have had at least mm, eight, 10 phone calls immediately. That's Gordon Martinez, the candidate for Las Vegas Sheriff. So what was your reaction when you first found out who the killers were, that it was Jared and Amanda? Oh, yeah. No. Why, why couldn't I have just listened to that little voice and maybe warned somebody? As news reports identified the attackers, there was a reason Gordon's phone rang off the hook. In an interview at the Bundy Ranch, Jared had worn a certain T-shirt. My campaign T-shirt of Gordon Martinez for sheriff. Now, people linked his campaign to two cop killers, he told his volunteers to stop wearing that shirt. I mean, the Millers left kind of a lot of breadcrumbs before they did these horrible acts. Oh, I know. I had no idea that they would go this, this far. Usually what you have is uh, somebody like that that's just all mouth. Usually, but let's try a thought experiment. What if Jared and Amanda had been Muslim? Here's David again. Clearly, if they had been Muslim and talking about jihad, I think the approach to them would have been substantially different. The couple was able to carry out a murderous plot because no one really believed them. 
The Fed sure didn't. That's despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of attacks against police are by right-wing extremists, not terrorists claiming to act in the name of Islam. The investigative fund database makes that clear. So why do you think the danger that someone like the Millers posed is treated so differently? Hmm. But why? <laughs> it's complex. Hateful rhetoric on the far right has become so commonplace, many people ignore it. David says there's a reason ISIS-related threats grab more attention. A lot of it is a result of institutionalized systemic racism. Because they're, they were white kids from Indiana who were just talking about shooting police, nobody took it very seriously. The fatal ambush of officers Alan Beck and Igor Soldo hit the Vegas Police Department hard. Officer Tyler Todd is treasurer of the local police union. He used to patrol the area where the shooting took place with Officer Soldo. Do you have a feeling like that could have been you? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the CC's pizza that they were eating at, him and I had gone there several times. Exact same scenario. Um, you know, we wanted to clock back a month or two. Um, definitely could have been him and I there. Tyler's late colleague left behind his wife and an infant son. He was uh, a brilliant guy at, at policing. He was going to go real far. He busted his butt and knew what he was doing and actually was teaching other guys new things because he was always, always looking, always learning. And he's, he's missed. That's why it aches for him to consider what everyone missed about the Millers. It's frustrating and, and, and painful to know how this all transpired. And But if you sit there and think about it, it's just not going to help anybody. So why isn't more being done to stop right-wing terrorists like the Millers? Daryl Johnson used to run an office that tracked those threats in the Department of Homeland Security. In 2009, he wrote a report that sounded the alarm about the resurgence of right-wing extremists. Soon after, he was pushed out of the agency. Daryl joins me to talk about what's changed and what hasn't. Hey, Daryl, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Does that office that you worked in, domestic terrorism, does that exist today? It does not. There was about, I want to say, 20 to 25 analysts looking at Muslim extremists uh, conducting violent attacks here in the United States, and there was just my team of five. Uh, so that whole branch was dissolved. In fact, they did a massive reorganization of the whole office. So they had yet to uh, look at this subject or to reconstitute the unit that I once led. And that's been, what, eight years now? And so what have you been seeing now, now that you've been out of the government for a while, and we're kind of in a new era? Yeah, so we're in a very interesting time I've been looking at this topic since the early 80s, and typically during Republican administrations, we see kind of the far right dialing back on its activities and the group counts decreasing. Uh, just the opposite is happening this time around, and this is the first time uh, hate crimes are up uh, against Muslim communities in 2016. We've had a number of uh, far right attacks so far this year. We had, of course, the Portland stabbings. Uh, we had a black uh, soldier that was stabbed and killed at the University of Maryland College Park. We also had a white supremacist from Baltimore that traveled up to New York City and stabbed the first black person he saw hoping to uh, incite a race war, and that was another fatal stabbing. So these are just a few of the things that have happened so far in 2017. It's been a very active year. Well, Daryl, thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate you. Thank you. None of them would agree to an interview with us, but Homeland Security did send a statement. In it, they concentrate on all threats to the homeland and work closely with state, local, and federal law enforcement. 